way, uh, my name is Bob and uh, Brim, and I'm chief engineer. I'm actually owner of Palomar Engineers too, and um, I'm actually technically my wife owns it. It's a woman-owned business, and that allows us to get a lot of business with the military. Uh, by the way, and uh, we're going to be talking about NFED antennas to, uh, and give you a little recap tonight, and kind of show you some of the options because there are a lot of different types of antennas that are called NFEDs, but in fact they uh, they are something different. So we're going to give you. a a highlight into that uh, tonight. So uh, thanks, Pat, for giving us a little history, but I didn't found, uh, 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 found uh, uh, Palomar. It actually was founded by uh, Jack Altos, K6NY, who was a CW crack operator until he passed away in 2013 at the age of 92. Uh, but he founded it in 1965, just about, uh, I think uh, MFJ was 1966 or 67. And they uh, basically copied a lot of the Jack's products over the years, took them to China and made them cheaper. And that's why uh, uh, the company didn't uh, sell, uh, doesn't sell those products anymore. And uh, one time he had about 250 employees and uh, was a pretty, pretty good sized company. We, we bought the company from the estate in uh, 2013. It consisted of a 10 foot by 10 foot storage area with all the engineering drawings in pencil, by the way. Uh, Jack always wanted to erase his, his mistakes. And so everything was in pencil. So I have all the schematics, all the products uh, since the inception of the company in 1965. And to the extent that I, I could, I put those manuals together and I put them on the uh, download section of our website. So if you have any of the old Palomar products and probably some of the ones you've never heard of, uh, they're up there. And uh, it's pretty interesting to look at some of the innovations that he came up with uh, way back when. But uh, we decided to, uh, uh, we liked the company name because it had been advertising in QST since about 1966, I think it was. And we still advertise every month in QST. And uh, so we decided to uh, switch around a little bit and look at uh, what was going on in the markets. And uh, we decided to make it an RFI solutions company. Uh, and uh, we eventually became RFI solutions and antennas. And so we have a lot of ferrite core products uh, balance onions and feed line chokes. And I give a whole talk on uh, uh, enhancing your station with uh, balance onions and feed line chokes. will make a major difference. And I'll touch a little bit on that tonight. Uh, antenna systems, off-center feds, end feds, loops, and terminated terminated dipoles, which, which we're the only people making those right now. And there's a big demand for them uh, from the military and from uh, all of the uh, uh, ambassadorships all around the country, turned of the world actually. And if you remember Kurt Sturba, he was in uh, CQ magazine. That was actually Jack Althaus. He was uh, his DBA was uh, was Kurt Sturba, and uh, he published uh, Kurt Sturba kind of a spoof on ham radio and uh, a pretty com uh, comedic uh, 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 comments on other other types of manufacturers and and uh, some of the baloney that was going on in ham radio. Anyway, those are available for free download on the website, and you're welcome to the to those. Uh, we distribute through Ham Radio Outlet, have been doing that for years. Uh, we also sell direct and we also on eBay. And uh, our markets are typically uh, consumer, commercial, and military, consumer meeting Ham Radio and uh, uh, every everybody who's got an RFI problem, which is more and more of us every day. So that's a little bit of background in the company. Let's just go into uh, some of the, um, the NFED topics that we're gonna cover tonight. And I'm going to put a little spin on it for RFI since that's a, it's an issue with a lot of people who run NFEDs in their attics and around the house perimeters and those types of things. But I'm going to give you a short overview of antenna feed points. It looks like everybody in the crowd here is, has got some uh, experience in uh, antennas and ham radio. So we'll, we'll touch on that uh, quickly. Uh, talk a little bit about dipoles, off-center feds, zeps, and loops uh, overview, and how they relate to the end feds, because a lot of the a lot of the principles are are uh, exactly the same. And a little bit about popular end fed antennas, and there's a couple to choose from. How to choose one that fits your needs, and then we're going to talk about the sequence of non-resonant end fed antennas, and uh, those are those are pretty interesting. Uh, typical configurations that work all the time. Uh, feed line chokes, counterpoises, and coax and noise filters, and how you integrate those with any antenna system, but in particular with, with NFEDs. And then we're going to solve a few uh, RFI problems that are associated with uh, NFEDs. So I'll use some of the typical solutions. And then we'll have a Q&A. And uh, if I was in front of you, I'd, I'd award uh, prizes. But uh, since I'm not, we'll just give you a, a golden cup award, so to speak. 
Okay, so let's put our thinking caps on and talk a little bit about antenna feed options. And essentially, they're center fed, they're center fed, off center fed, and end fed. And they all have different characteristics. And so on the next page, we'll talk a little bit about dipoles. Uh, typically, a dipole is about a half wavelength in, in, uh, in length. And it can be horizontal, vertical, it doesn't make any difference. A center fed means it's 50% on each side, essentially. And the impedance, if you look on the lower left-hand corner there, you'll see the, the impedance at the feed point varies with height above ground. So if you're putting your antenna up, your 80 or 40 meter dipole up about 30, 35 feet, uh, the impedance is typically between 50 and 75 ohms. If you put it up way high, um, uh, it becomes higher than that or, what, or uh, exactly a quarter wavelength that may jump to 100, 100 ohms. And so you have to either feed it correctly uh, or just be satisfied with, let's say, a, 200, a two to one uh, SWR if it's 100 ohms, for example. But you can play some tricks with that 100 ohms, and I'll show you how to do that in a second, even if it's low. Off-center feds are typically, uh, uh, other commercial uh, folks use uh, 66, 34%. Uh, one side, 66% of the length, uh, the other side's 34. There's a problem with doing that. We use 80-20, uh, which gives you a much better uh, match and it gives you a couple extra bands that you normally would not get, i.e. 15 meters. Uh, the impedance when you move it off-center tends to go up. And if you moved it all the way to the end, it would go up to a couple thousand ohms, but between 50 ohms in the middle, and uh, uh, towards the, uh, the one end of it, there's gonna be a sweet spot around two to 300 ohms. And that's an easy match for a four to one uh, transformer, which is what most people use and so do we. And so the feed point impedance is, is a function of the height above ground for uh, horizontal type uh, antennas. And these, these couple of the little diagram that's moving on the side just shows you how the, the polarity changes on that thing every cycle. So. Uh, but the, uh, the voltage is at the ends. On end feds, depending upon what type you have, they may be on one end or the other. Here's a couple uh, typical examples of off-center feds. And there's some tricks in here, actually, that, that aren't, uh, that aren't uh, obvious. Uh, dipole is one-to-one uh, -one ballon. And by the way, anytime you use a coax fed antenna, you should have a ballon or a, or a feed line choke on it uh, at least. And I'll show you later on in the diagram why, that, why that's necessary. Um, if you uh, move your uh, off-center fed dipole or any dipole up too high, uh, the impedance will actually change, even though it's the same offset on each side. And, uh, and above about a half a wavelength, it, it turns to 300 ohms. Below that, it's about 200 ohms. And so you would either use a four to one ballon or a six to one ballon. And uh, when we make our off-center fed dipoles, we put not only uh, ballons in there, we also put uh, 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 chokes at the same time in the same, uh, same box. Uh, so you don't have to buy two different things. But uh, here's a couple of things on the bottom here, two different antennas. The one on the left, lo lower left, is a, a 40 meter antenna. And because it's so low, the impedance is gonna be, um, it's, got, it's gonna be 75 to 100 ohms. But uh, one of the tricks that you can do is you can make each side a little bit different in length. In other words, you're offsetting it a little bit uh, on one side. And by doing that, the impedance will go up. It'll go up to the point where it's just about 50 ohms. And that's, that's where you'd want it. You can do the same thing on the one on the right. In this case, they're just using some loading coils on there so that you can work uh, uh, the uh, uh, 75 meters with the full length and uh, 20 meters up to the uh, point where the uh, loading coils are. So easy way with 66 foot antenna to work 75 and 20 meters. And for a lot of folks, they just can't get on 80 because they, they don't have the length uh, in, uh, in terms of a dipole uh, to use that. You can do it with some of our off-center feds. That, I mean, some of our end feds uh, at 71 feet. And we'll show you how to do that a little bit later. But that's just an idea that most people don't know. If you, if you have a low dipole, you don't have to have each side equal. If you move it off a little bit, your SWR can actually can actually uh, uh, improve. Our off-center fed dipoles uh, are 80 per, uh, excuse, eighty percent and twenty percent, and we put a resonance compensator in the middle in order to uh, give you the full width of the uh, eighty meter band. But other than that, they're, uh, they're they look similar to others. The advantage is is that uh, you pick up uh, nine bands. Uh, you pick up 15 meters, uh, uh, 12 meters, and uh, just recently I noticed that we can get uh, we get 30 meters uh, also on this on this one antenna. 
and uh, it's uh, it's pretty pretty interesting way to do it. We sell a lot of these uh, through HRO, and we also make a 40 through 10 one, uh, which a 40 through six one as well as an 80 through uh, six one. And we have another one called a double offset uh, antenna, which has actually got two offset antennas built into one. And if you're curious about what that is, go to the website, and look at our offset an antennas, and I have a whole theory of how that works. It's pretty interesting. So we're the only people that I've ever, I've ever seen do that. Okay, looking at uh, half-wave dipoles, they can be vertical, they can be horizontal. You've probably seen these before. Uh, the one on the left uh, is a typical two-meter one, and it's got a short section and a long section. And they can do that with phasing. You can do it as slopers, all different with coils, different ways. But essentially, they're dipoles, and uh, either they're uh, fed in the middle or they're or they're offset. And uh, uh, they can be phased if you put them uh, multiple ones, like uh, the two meter ones on the right hand side. Uh, Zep antennas. Uh, there's a there's an interesting antenna that which works absolutely wonderful. It's called a ZS6BKW. It's center fed. Uh, it's, not, it's 46 feet on each side, and it's exact, just about exactly 40 feet uh, to the of ladder line. And believe it or not, on about five bands, that thing is absolutely uh, one to one or 1 1.5 to one. It doesn't, doesn't really vary. You don't really need a tuner with it at all. On 80 meters, you need a tuner, but uh, on all those other bands, it's a fairly, um, a fairly decent antenna. It radiates very well. It just doesn't work very well in the rain because the rain gets into the ladder line, it, uh, it messes it up. So other than that, uh, I use that antenna all the time. One of my favorites. And of course, you probably know about loops, uh, loop antennas, uh, uh, and they have some characteristics of the NFEDs we'll, we'll talk about in a second. Uh, the best way to run a loop is uh, if you're going to run it on one band, use a two to one balance because the impedance is about 110 ohms. If you're going to run it on all bands, then use a four to one uh, balance. And uh, there's an example of one of ours on the lower right hand side there. And um, uh, that way you can work uh, all bands with it. Uh, typically an 80 meter um, a loop, about 270 feet around, either in a triangle or a square, will work all bands from 80 through six meters, including the work bands, by the way. And uh, it's a very quiet antenna. You'll love it if you've ever tried one. All right, now let's talk a little bit about NFED types. There's three, basically three different types. There's the NFED ZEPs, which we'll show a picture of, NFED half waves, which tend to be pretty popular these days, and they have their pluses and their minuses. And then we have the non-resonant NFED. Believe it or not, a resonant antenna and a non-resonant antenna can radiate just about equally as well. But there's a lot of good characteristics of the non-resonant ones. That's non-resonant in the hand bands. It's resonant somewhere, obviously. So you've probably already, already seen the NFED half-wave ZEP. Essentially, it's a half-wave antenna, and they're voltage-fed. They're NFED at the end, so that means that you've moved the feed point all the way out to the end, and that's where the high voltage is, and therefore you have very high um, impedance. Well, one of the, you can match this uh, NFEDs up several ways. One is you can use a fancy transformer up there, like, like we'll show you in the next um, uh, um, description of the NFED half wave. Or you can use any quarter wave section of transmission line. It could be coax, could be ladder line, could be a wide ladder line, small ladder line, it doesn't make any difference. But one of the characteristics of quarter wavelength transmission line is if you short it at one end, the other end's gonna have high impedance, all right? And that's exactly what's done here. And so if you take your, your coax and you, you, you go up from the bottom, which is zero ohms, you will find a point where it's pretty close to 50 ohms. All right, and that will match very well on the NFED, and it works very, very well on even harmonics. So it'll work on 80, uh, for example, uh, 40, 20, and 10 uh, with the same antenna, all right? As long as you're within the, the quarter wavelength or multiples thereof on the, each one of those bands. Uh, typically though, most people run them as a single band antenna. Uh, you can use multiple bands if you uh, use, you put it into a, uh, um, uh, antenna tuner. Uh, you can, uh, they're, they're very friendly in terms of uh, how you put them up. They can be horizontal, vertical, uh, or whatever, you know, or zigzag, and they'll still work just about the uh, same thing. One of the things that you do need, though, is you do need a choke on it at the, uh, wherever the coax attaches to the, uh, uh, the feed line, or the antenna feed point, rather. 
Okay, let's move on to, here's a couple more examples. You've probably seen J-poles. Essentially, that's a half-wave antenna with a quarter-wave matching stub on it. And you're tapping it up uh, so far uh, uh, to uh, get the 50 ohm point. And it's very obvious right here on the, this is a 440 megahertz one. It's, it's shorted here. There's a quarter wavelength on one end and there's a, a quarter wavelength plus a half wavelength on that. And they're moving up the tap point until they get right to 50, 50 ohms. And at, at that frequency, you only need a, a, a single ferrite in order to be effective. We'll talk about that in a second, but uh, that's, that's enough of a, of a choke at that frequency because uh, one, uh, one of these beads at that frequency has an impedance of about 500 to 600 ohms, which is, uh, which is plenty at that frequency. On 80 meters, you'd need 15 of them. Uh, but on uh, this frequency, you only, need, you only need one or two. And uh, Kush graph, uh, the, uh, the uh, R5, R7, R9, these are basically the same thing. It's half wavelength with a little skirt down here, and it's fed it, uh, with a feed point uh, right there. So that's essentially an NFED ZEP antenna. All right, the NFED half wave now is a completely different antenna. It's similar, but uh, it's, uh, uh, it still has to be the right length, okay? It has to be a half a wavelength with or without uh, a loading coil on it, all right? Uh, it typically works very well on the harmonics. So it would work, if it's cut for 80 meters, it'll work on 80, 40, 20, and 10, all right? Uh, but you're gonna have to use a tuner or you're gonna have to play some games. And that's what they've done with that coil up there. They've physically shortened it on some bands uh, and um, electrically shortened it too. But on the 80 meters, it uses the, the entire wire plus uh, the loading coil, plus the additional uh, part for, uh, for 80 meters. And that's how they can make it work on multiple bands. Generally, you still have to use a, uh, a loading coil uh, I'm not a loading coil, but a, a antenna tuner uh, to get uh, all the bands uh, with a reasonable SWR. Some bands will be high with a half wave, some won't. One of the cons is it's long. You got to have 135 feet to make uh, to make uh, 100, 120 to 135 feet to make it work on uh, 80 meters. It's got a complex matching unit and. Uh, we actually make uh, uh, the 49 to one balance for the uh, or ununs for these uh, unbalanced unbalanced. And uh, one of the issues with making these is they're not very broadband. You can make, we make ours about 20, 25 megahertz wide, uh, but uh, they're difficult to make with high power and work, um, work a very uh, uh, a broad frequency range. Uh, a four to one or a, or a one to one or a nine to one, you can make those work from uh, you know, 100 kilohertz to two meters, uh, at least we can. And uh, most people can't uh, do that, but uh, the 49 to ones tend to be, you know, maybe three to 30 megahertz if you really got a good one. Uh, the other disadvantage is, is you have a lot of high voltage there. So you can't use the matching unit low, or at least if you do use it at a low level uh, altitude, like two or three feet, uh, you wanna make sure that kids and animals and stuff don't have uh, access to that feed point because there is high voltage there. It's a voltage fed antenna. And the current's, uh, uh, the, the voltage is, uh, is low in the middle, but it's very, very high in, at the ends. And so you just have to make sure it's not, um, it's not uh, in the way of anything that can get in touch with it. Uh, you still need to use a choke. Uh, an example of one of our chokes is a maxi choker there. Uh, it's about, uh, that's rated at 3KW and it provides uh, about uh, 40 dB of choking, which is absolutely the best in the industry. Um, the matching unit does get hot with power and actually physically warm if you, uh, particularly on the non-harmonic work bands. And uh, you just got to be careful you don't heat it up. You have to use three, four, five uh, rings of toroids just to work, uh, you know, uh, 1500 watts. And so you got to be, you got to be careful with those. A lot of people make these themselves because they're very expensive commercially, typically a couple hundred bucks. Ours aren't, but uh, most other, other people charge a couple hundred dollars for a for a expensive 40, 49 to one. The al other alternative is a non-resident NFED antenna. And one of the reasons that we use that uh, and we make, actually make the whole antenna system, whereas we don't make the NFEDs because of the liability of the high voltage, uh, we use the, the non-resident NFEDs. And what the principle is, is that if you are a resident outside the hand bands, all right, let's say eight megahertz or something like that, inside the hand bands, 
the feed point becomes very close. You can choose a feed point length so that um, an antenna length rather, so that the feed point is very close to four to 500 ohms, all right? And so that means you can use a simple nine to one bound or anun that um, matches very, very easily. And so that's the principle of what we're, what we're using. They're easy to deploy. And by the way, you can work 80 meters with a 71 foot antenna versus a 130 foot antenna. And that's a big deal for people who are in homeowner associations or, or uh, condominiums, or they wanna put it in their attic or run it around the periphery of their house or something like that. They just don't have that, that amount of uh, uh, footage to do 130 feet. Uh, so 71 feet works really well. They can run it out to in, on, in the eaves and they can just feed it right, uh, right next to where their station window is, for example. They will work the work bands and they will not heat up on the work bands, okay? Uh, they're very stealthy. There's lots of different configurations. I'll show you some of those in, in just a minute. And they're safe and simple and it's low voltage uh, matching. Still, you don't wanna to touch it, of course, but it's a current fed antenna. It's not a voltage fed antenna. Therefore, uh, it's, um, it, uh, it's much easier on uh, the environment. One of the cons is, is basically the coax becomes part of the antenna. Now, if you think about it, this is really an off-center fed antenna. The long part of the off-center fed is the vertical wire and the horizontal in this case. It's actually the physical wire. But the short side is actually all the way from the antenna matching unit Tone down, and you can see down uh, in the bottom here, there's a choke. This feed line choke from this distance here, this is the short part of the antenna. This is the long part of the antenna here. So you essentially have chosen a point on that feed, uh, on that dipole, so to speak, that gives you a uh, impedance in the hand bands, typically around four to 500 ohms, you see? The ones we were talking about before, the dipoles were resonant in the hand bands. And so the distances were typically, you know, 66% or 80%. But if they're resonant outside the hand bands, you have the advantage that you can choose a point here where you still have a lot of wire that radiates and a short amount of counterpoise with the choke here. And that stops the antenna radiating, stops the outside braid from radiating. And then you just run it into your radio, all right? And there's an advantage to this. This also acts as a coax noise filter. And you, there are several different ones that you can put here to, uh, for that feed line choke. The one that we're showing here is just a simple $10 ring with RG8 wrapped through it about eight to 10 times and then plugged in the back of the radio. But the coax will radiate. And as a, as a result of that, sometimes the coax is closer to the house than the antenna and it gets into things. And that's why we have to talk a little bit about a uh, little bit about RFI on the thing, but it's a very convenient antenna. The Boy Scouts uh, on their jamboree on the air use about a thousand of these worldwide. They're, they're, they, <laughs> they, uh, and they came to uh, our QTH and, uh, they wanted, a, they wanted an antenna that they could use portable. And uh, like the parks on the air and the summits on the air, all those guys are using this too. And that, so they, they took this uh, uh, little piece of PVC and I said, throw it above this branch over here, see if, it, see if it breaks when it hits the concrete on the other side, and it didn't. And so it, it was about 16 feet up and we ran it out to another tree and they started working uh, people um, uh, all across the United States with it. And they picked it up and it said, it looks like a giant bullet. And that's why it was called a bullet antenna. There, there you, now you know the story. Okay, let's move on to uh, a little bit of recap here and then we'll go into some specifics of the non-resident. Uh, the NFED ZEP uses ladder line for matching. And of course you can use that for anything low loss. You don't wanna use coax to do that. The NFED half wave works on even harmonics the best. All right, and it's uh, typically uh, a high voltage at the feed point. That's the thing I don't like about it. The non-resident is shorter, it's simpler matching, it's low voltage, and it works on many bands with a shorter length. It's the most convenient one. And uh, after ha having sold 10,000 of these things, I think a lot of people agree with that. There's a lot of these in the, uh, the villages in Florida, for example, that are strung around the outside of the, uh, uh, the houses of, of a lot of the people that are down there. So how do you set this thing up? All right, we're gonna go over four things here. How do you determine the wire length to use? Because you can use multiple wire lengths that are non-resonant. How to match the antenna and how to choose a configuration 
horizontal, inverted L, zigzag, you name it. And uh, how, how uh, important is that? And then choosing a feed line choke or a noise filter. Which ones, which ones do you use for the best bang for the buck? And then how do you uh, apply these to uh, your location? So first of all, let's talk about how long it is, all right? You can pick a lot of different wire lengths and there's an, some examples here. Longer is better for low bands, all right? One of the better ones that we have is 155 feet. With that, and I'll show you some SWR graphs later, you can work just about all the bands from 160 up, all right? But with a 71 footer, in fact, somebody called me yesterday and says, Bob, I put up that 71 footer just as a, as a horizontal antenna, 35 feet up, and I can work 160 to six for that. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And he wrote a big, long, nice uh, 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 discussion on it on Ehand. And I said, well, that's really good. Most guys can't work 160, but for some reason, the lengths that he had chosen for his coax and where he put the choke worked out just well for him. But typically with 71 feet, you can work uh, you know, 80, 80 through 10 and usually six meters also including most of the bands inside. Uh, but the longer, of course, the better. We'll show you what some of those lengths are. Uh, the counterpoise, um, the, let's, let's go back. The coax cable is typically 50 to 75% of the antenna length. So if you had a 71 foot antenna, for example, you probably have about 50 feet of coax and you would put your choke right around 35 feet. And that would be a nice, a nice offset uh, uh, for, the, uh, for most of the bands. And your match would be real close to four to 500 ohms. Uh, if you don't have that much uh, length of coax, you just wind it up and just put the choke there anyway, and it will just uh, use it that way. Uh, you can use counterpoisons. Uh, the coax acts as a, basically a counterpoise. Uh, if you don't want to use the, uh, the coax as a counterpoise, you don't want it to radiate, you can actually just put a wire, uh, a wire out there, which is a non-resonant length. And you can use multiple ones for multiple bands as long as they're not resonant, as long as they're not a quarter way length, for example. All right. So uh, typical NFED uh, uh, setup would consist of, uh, the, of course, a radio, a choke, the coax. In this case, we're showing two 15 foot uh, counterpoises here uh, attached to here. And then we're, we're, this is an inverted L and I think it goes up about oh, 15, 20 feet. And then it goes out and it can either go uh, down. And this is the, the configuration that we use at most of the ham fests. Uh, we have a, a fiberglass pole that goes up about 25 feet. And we just take the remaining wire. We always use 71 footers. We just take the remaining wire, go out to a cyclone fence and just tie a piece of paracord to it. And that's what we work. When we were down in, um, in um, uh, uh, was it San, the Santee swap meet, we put that up and uh, at four o'clock, five o'clock in the morning, we were working JAs on uh, 40 meters with that thing. It was just, it was pretty crazy. So they work, they work really well. Uh, some of the SWR factors, uh, the configuration does make but does make a difference, but it's not super critical. Uh, the, use the recommended length for the feed lines. Uh, you have to put a choke somewhere along the uh, the coax to to stop the radiation. You can top feed it. You can bottom feed it. You can you can put the uh, rate, the uh, matching unit high. You can put it low. You can do inverted L's. Uh, you can make it completely horizontal. You can make the um, uh, the matching unit uh, very, very high, hoist it into a tree and then have it go down to eight or 10 feet on a pole somewhere else. Um, the length and the number of counterpoises sometimes makes a difference, uh, particularly if you just have one band that just won't come in SWR wise where you like it, you can just add an additional uh, counterpoise to it until the, uh, and, and choose a length that makes that particular band work. It's okay to have multiple lengths and multiple uh, counterpoises because on a, a particular band, the RF will just choose the one that's the lowest impedance. So I'm going to give you some examples next of typical lengths uh, of the antenna and what you can expect for SWRs. So here's a 55 footer. And this is a, a graph of, uh, this is the SWR three to one line right through here. This is actually the red line is the is the SWR, and it's sweeping from uh, one meg one megahertz up to 61 megahertz. And so here's the band: six, 10, 15, 20, 80, 40. So not real good on 80 meters. The SWR is pretty high. On 40, it dips just about you know uh, a little bit about three to one, and then anything above about uh, <clears throat> 20 meters, the SWR is less than three to one. So that that's that's a short length. 
but uh, the antenna tuners and most of your radials will, will uh, tune that out and it shouldn't be any problem. Now, if you, if you uh, step up just a little bit in length and go to uh, 71 feet, what you'll find is, and by the way, we're, we've changed the, the graph a little bit. This is the two to one line. This is the three to one, this is two to one. So if you follow the two to one all the way across, just about every band, is less than, this is through six meters, by the way, is less than two to one, all right? Even, even uh, 15 meters here, and even 40 meters. 80 is about still about three to one, but it's just still a little bit short for, for that. But still, all the bands are less than two to one. You pr virtually don't need a tuner for any of those. And this configuration was uh, 20, 25 feet vertical on a fiberglass pole, and it was out 52 feet to a 10 foot pole. There was about 100 feet of coax and the choke was at the 43 foot level and we had to use a tuner on 80 meters. Other than that, beautiful antenna, you hardly even had to uh, touch it. And this was only 71 feet, by the way, and you were able to work all those bands. If you go up a little bit longer, all right, go to 92 feet, magic starts to occur. All right. So here's the, the red lines of the SW, this is the two to one line, but look at this, 160, 80, 60 meters, 40 meters, 30, not quite. It's still still under two to one. 20 is, is pretty low with a low part of 20. Yeah, but most of the bands will are coming in here under between uh, 1.25 and two, all the way out to, uh, in this case, uh, this is 10 meters, all the way out to 31 megahertz. I didn't do six megahertz or, or, six, me or six meters in this one. And that's 20 feet vertical, 72 feet out, two counterpoises. And then we drove a, uh, a little, uh, a little uh, counterpoise with a 24 inches long. We just took, it, took a nail and, and drove it into the ground. <laughs> and this is the SWR that we got. So very, very useful. And um, uh, it's only 92 feet long and you get 80 meters. And it looks like part of 160 also. If you go, if you really want to make it on 160 and, and, and uh, virtually without an antenna tuner, and again, this is the two to one line is right here. So if you follow that across, the two to one line is right there. And these are all 1.5 to 1.25 all the way out. And this is uh, uh, what, uh, 1.1, 1. 1. 1, 40, 40 meters is down here at 1.25, 80 meters is 1.1, 1. 1, 1. 1.2, and 160 is below two meters for the whole band, all right? So you can see it doesn't take a lot of antenna in order to get on just virtually all, all the different bands. Uh, this is just a table. And by the way, these, these, this PowerPoint presentation is on the website. It's under tech support and it's under presentations. I uploaded it uh, this morning. So it's in Adobe format and it's also in PowerPoint. So if you wanna review it or look at any of these charts and stuff, they're, they're already up there. This is just a chart of uh, how long the wire length is, where you put the choke, and what the total antenna length is, and some of the options for a, a choke at the on the uh, on the uh, uh, coax depend primarily on what type of coax you're using. If you're running under you know a thousand watts, you can really get a, get along with RG8X. If you're running full power or digital at fifteen hundred watts, then you probably should use a little bit bigger uh, coax uh, because the losses tend to be a little bit more, but not necessarily that much to worry about. But uh, uh, if you're just using RG8X, just put a simple choke uh, for the, uh, uh, the, uh, the choke. Just put a simple uh, uh, ferrite ring, mix 31. If you wanna get a little bit better, you use a mini choker here. And the mini choker is typically, uh, to put it in perspective, this is probably 15 to 20 dB of attenuation of noise and also of uh, signal uh, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, of, of as working as a stop sign. It has nothing to do with the signal going through the center. This one here is right around 20, uh, 25 to 35 dB. And this one goes up to 48 dB. It's absolutely, it'll, it'll quiet down your, your radio like you've never heard. It's pretty, pretty good. Can't keep those in stock. All right, matching wise, there's a couple options. This is, a t this is the bullet. This is the one they threw over the branch and they called it a bullet because it looked like a big shell. And uh, this is where you hook the counterpoise if you're using it. Otherwise, you're using the coax as part of the counterpoise. The antenna uh, output is right here, but this also acts as a halyard hoist. So you can hoist it up in the trees or however you want to do it. Uh, 
They, they will match anything, although it says nine to one, it'll match any impedance typically between 300 and 900 uh, ohms. Uh, we don't use toroids in any of our, our, our rings and any of our matching units. We use uh, uh, long, long beads, uh, just like they do in the solid state amplifiers. And because of that, ours are much more broad banded and uh, we use a lot less wire. Therefore, there's a lot loss and that's why they're so, so broad. Um, you can, uh, there's connections for all these, as I've talked about. This is a 500 watt version. We make one about three times this uh, height uh, for 1500 watts. And we also make them in a, a cube style here with mounting tabs, because you can mount them to the side of a wall or something like that. So this is an example of a nine to one, 1500 watts, right? Same principles, uh, ground or, or counterpoise, and then the outputs up here and then the coax goes in down here. Uh, we also make a four to one, nine to one combination. So it's nine to one up here, which is the same as this, but we also put a four to one out here in case you uh, want to experiment with some different type of antennas that require a four to one. And uh, those are uh, those are uh, pretty popular. Both of these are sold through HRO, or you can you can buy them buy them direct, and they're in the, they're in the ninety dollar range. They're not very expensive. Feed line choke wise, this is the uh, common mode uh, noise filter that I was talking about before. As you can see here, uh, it's about 38 dB of, of, of uh, noise rejection. Put it in perspective, that's about six S units. Now well, that's a lot, right? If you can reduce your common mode noise by six S units, uh, uh, you, you, you're, you can work signals you can't even hear before. Um, just a little short um, brief use of uh, chokes in general. If you put a choke at the antenna feed point, as, sh as shown over here, basically what that does is all the RF that's coming back out here will stay on the antenna and it acts as a stop sign for any current that, that would come back down the outside of the coax. All right. We, you should all know by looking at your ages, just by how old I am, uh, the coax has got three conductors, right? It's got three, one, two, three conductors. That outside braid is actually two electrical conductors, the inside and the outside. And the outside uh, acts as a, uh, an alternative path for your transmit signal that's coming in on the inside. It says, hey, I can either go on the antenna, like one side of the dipole, or I can come back down to the coax and go this way. And when, you do, when it does that, it radiates. That radiation causes a lot of RFI and those types of things. Now, even if you put a choke up here, all right, what happens is, is from that, that, this point right here below the choke, all the way back to here, any interference can get into that outside part of the coax that, uh, that acts as the third conductor and be fed right into your transceiver. Why? Because when you screw in the, co the coax connector in the back of your radio, you connect not only the signal through the center, you connect the signal through the inside of the braid and the outside of the braid. And the only thing the ferrite works on is the outside of the braid, all right? And so you can tell very quickly if it's going to do you any good. And I'll tell you a quick trick for that. I don't know. I don't think I had it in here. But if you if you take your coax from your radio and you unplug it and just put the center conductor in only and measure the noise level, it could be S2, S3, whatever it is it is. And now screw in the outside. And if it jumps up, the ferrites will get rid of that jump up portion. All right. And it's even worse if you've got an antenna switch with two or three antennas on it. If you got it for just, just take an antenna switch with two antennas on, how many receive antennas do you have? You have three. You have the unused braid, which is not switched. You have the antenna that you're switched to, and you've got the center conductor. You've got three antennas. So a lot of times you may have a switch with five or six antennas on it, right? And you're electronically switching it or mechanically or whatever, but you got a, you got a, and they're all over the property, but you may have a, an antenna next to somebody uh, uh, on one side and they just turn on their grow lights and you're not even using that antenna, but guess what? You're using the antenna on the other side of the property, but the braid of that coax is coming right into your radio, right? So the only way to solve that problem is you got to isolate them all before the switch, all right? You got to put a choke in every one of them before the switch or disconnect them. And there's no antenna um, um, switch that I know of that, that that separates the braid and the center conductor when you switch from antenna to antenna. All the braids are always connected together, all right? It's a common ground. Well, it's a common uh, ground. It's it's all those antennas hooked together too that you don't know about or you don't even think you're choosing. Well, they're still there unless you uh, put a choke in every line and then, that, then they go away.
and you don't have that problem. All right, very very subtle, but it's one of the ways that DXers uh, stay DXers, the good ones. These are the different types of chokes. We talked about those a little bit earlier. Uh, typically, uh, you want as much resistance in these as possible. And if you don't know anything about ferrites, you can uh, you can look at my other uh, talk uh, or download it from the website. But ferrites are basically frequency dependent resistors. That's what they are. So they have different resistance at different frequencies. All right. So at the low frequencies, these if this was put on, let's say, an 80 meter antenna, each one of these is roughly 50 ohms a piece. So five. So five of them that they're just like resistors they add in series. You'd have about 250 ohms. However, at um, at uh, 30 megahertz, they're about 150 to 200 ohms each. So they're almost, a you know, that's a thousand ohms. And the rule of thumb uh, in order to have uh, a measurable difference is you need at least 10 times the line impedance. So if you have a 50 ohm cable, you need at least 500 ohms. If you don't have 500 ohms, you won't be able to tell the difference, all right? So if you, or if you buy uh, ferrites that aren't marked that tell you what the resistance is on each one, you buy them off of Amazon or eBay, you know, 100 for a dollar or 100 for 10 bucks or whatever they are these days. They don't, they don't put any specs on them. And the reason they don't is because they're recycled from TV sets and, and from video uh, uh, video monitors and things like that. And they just recycle them. And they, and, but video uh, monitor ferrites are typically 300 to 600 megahertz. They're useless on the handbands, all right? We're the only company that has actually the, the resistance by frequency on ours uh, that's labeled. So just uh, FYI. If you, if you take a, uh, a ring like this and you put multiple turns through it, you typically get 1,000 to 4,000 ohms. That's a quick and dirty. This is a $10 solution. This on, this, this, these are about $6 a piece. So you've actually got, you're actually much, much better with this uh, with a smaller cable than you would be with this. So this would be used, for example, between a radio and an amplifier. All right? Really useful for that. All right? or, or it could be used as the, uh, the choke on a, uh, an NFED antenna on the coax. All right. The noise filter, on the other hand, uh, puts these puts both of these to shame. These are typically 30, 38 uh, dB, 6 S units. These are about uh, 2 to 4 S units, and this is about, about 1 to 2 S units, uh, at, at, depending upon what the frequency is. Right? But the rule of thumb is you need at least 500 ohms, 1,000 is much better, and that's what you should shoot for. So on 80 meters, you would need 10 of these, or, or you would need uh, this ring would be adequate on that frequency. They also make bigger, bigger uh, holes in them so you can run the larger cable too. But in most cases, you're better off going with something with connectors on it. This is a typical choke. And if you look at the frequency, remember I said they're, they're frequency dependent resistors. Now here's an example of, uh, let's see, this is just, a, this is very similar to this choke down here. And you can see by, this is the resistance, all right? And you can see by frequency, it goes down. This is uh, 10 meters right here. This is six meters. So by the time you get to six meters, you know it's down to uh, a very a very low value uh, because you can't you can't by because you choose different material for these things, you can't make one that works all the way across. This one, on the other hand, has got multiple ferrites in there and multiple different uh, compositions of the ferrites. And so what you can do is by putting those together, you can have a very broad impedance, which goes way out in this case, almost to 100, 180 megahertz, all right? This one can be used on two meters and it could be used on 160. It's not real effective on 160, but on the other hand, anything from about uh, seven, about uh, looks like about uh, 40 meters and up all the way out to two meters, this one's absolutely great. And we also make a low frequency one, which is absolutely great. And then it, it, it stops around 30 megahertz. We make a VHF one that, that we basically shifted it to VHF too. So these are very useful. And they're only about 70 bucks, 60 bucks. So it's not a, it doesn't break the bank and, and uh, they'll make a remarkable difference in your noise level. Uh, and when you look at impedance, uh, you can either look at attenuation in, in S units, this would be, so if you had a 5,000 ohm impedance, it would be about 34 dB, which is not quite six S units, all right? Our large ones, our very large maxi chokers run 48 dB, all right? That's eight S units, all right? 
I can't make enough of those. They're just, here's a typical uh, bullet antenna system. Uh, uh, we sell these, HRO sells them, consists of 71 feet of wire, the matching unit, a couple of counterpoises and a choke all in one package, sells for about $130. Or you can make them yourself. You know, you can obviously, we have nine to one kits. Uh, we sell all the parts individually. Um, you can buy the just the antenna without the noise filter and all the other stuff. Counterpoises you can buy separately. You can buy these separately. Uh, these are the uh, noise filters and these are the rings, of course. You don't get the coax, but you get the rings. But uh, you can buy them all, all individually and supply your own wire however you, however you want to do it. Uh, there is on the website under technical support, uh, if you go into the section called antennas, you can actually download the entire antenna configuration manual with about 10 different lengths and sizes with SWR graphs and all different types of information on how to configure and put these things up, all right? So it's real useful information and you can use our parts, their parts, who's ever, but it's a great antenna is all, is all I'm telling you. It's very useful. I'm gonna tell you a few things about what happens if you do have uh, the antennas real close to the house, you put them in the attic, for example, and suddenly your wife can't watch um, Dancing with the Stars anymore, okay? Or something like that, which is a real common issue. In my case, I had a touch lamp in my wife's bedroom that kept going on and off on 160 and 80. And it, I solved that problem, but it took, me a, it took me a few ferrites to do it. But um, there's other issues. Uh, so not only do uh, uh, you cause RFI to them, they can cause RFI to you. And things like um, anything made by uh, LG, uh, LG refrigerators, washer dryers, uh, Roku systems, their power supplies tend to be real noisy. They're fed into the uh, AC power lines and therefore the AC power lines act as their antennas and they're the little transmitter. Uh, routers have that issue sometimes, uh, computers, any electronic appliance that plugs in there, um, um, uh, mixers, those types of things. Refrigerators are real common. Uh, dishwashers, uh, even some microwaves uh, cause that. Plasma TVs, but you can fix all those problems very simply and inexpensively. In fact, if you're really good at, at, at creating a RFI, you may even get an award. And so we have an award that you can download on your webs on our website. It's called the Worked All Neighbors Award. Okay. And it's, it goes to your amateur radio station and you get endorsements for 5, 10, 25, 50, all right? And we'll sign it for you if you want. And it's RFI case endorsements, all right? So uh, that's been downloaded over 10,000 times. So I know people have a problem out there and they just want to make it. And there's a, there's a bunch of similar things to this that you can download too, but we thought we'd, we'd just show you one of them that uh, kind of, uh, it's kind of funny. Okay. Uh, typical RFI solutions, uh, just in general, uh, uh, keep your antenna and coax away from house wiring. House wiring, to typically on the low bands, the length of the wire in your house is a very good resonant antenna, an 80, 160, in some cases 40, all right? Uh, you won't have a problem with a two meter HT or something because the, the wires are too long. But on the other hand, if, you're, if you have a short wire like a uh, HDMI cable from your TV to your uh, uh, Roku system or something like that, it's short and therefore it'll pick up uh, high frequency stuff, right? If you're using a direct TV or using satellite, they all have coax. That coax third conductor on the outside, the shield will actually uh, funnel itself into TV sets and, and uh, uh, direct TVs and, and satellite receivers, those types of things. We have that little black box that you saw that provides 38 dB. We have it with F connectors in it, which is specifically used for satellite systems. All right, we tried to we tried to anticipate, and and our customers call us with different different issues, and that's one of the solutions that you can put in there. All those filters have no effect on the signal coming down the center, which is the one you want. They only affect the signal that's on the outside of the coax, which is typically where your transmit signal will end up. All right, so keep keep your um, keep your coax and your antennas as far away from the AC power, uh, cable satellite feeds, uh, telephone lines. If you're still using an in indoor telephone, but most people are using a long uh, a wired internet these days too. So wired internet causes the same problem. Or alarm systems. You ever you start transmitting and your beepers start going off on all your little alarms. That's another issue that can happen, particularly if they're hardwired into an alarm system. Um, and, uh, 
I'll take questions a little in, in, when we're done, as many as you want, guys. So uh, you can use Palomar kits or you can or, or any type of ferrites to do these as long as you get the right ones. And so let's I'm just going to give you a couple examples of what you can do. Uh, we have tr we have transceiver RFI kits, uh, which do two things. They keep the RF in, in your radio and they also get rid of noise coming into your radio from computers, digital uh, noise uh, filters. Uh, we use them on the DC power lines. In this case, we're, we, we have a ring that's on the, um, uh, <clears throat> the cable coming in, very similar to what we were talking about for the NFED uh, uh, antenna. And then we have different uh, little clip-ons here that go on the uh, DIN cables and uh, push the talk to amplifiers and stuff. Well, likewise, linear amplifiers are the same way. You probably will believe me uh, because we've been hams for a long time that all the RF that's supposed to go out this big cable doesn't always go out the big cable. All right, 90% of it or 95% will, but some of it leaks through and goes out through the different conductors and even in back through the uh, AC power lines. And then it gets into those and they act as transmitting antennas uh, for, your, for your linear when, you, and when they're not meant to. So by putting little stop signs on here, we have linear amplifier kits for virtually all of all the amplifiers by brand. And if we don't have a particular brand, we have generic ones that essentially work the same way. And we have it for AC, amp, uh, AC uh, amplifiers, uh, solid state, and also uh, for DC uh, type of uh, amplifiers. Uh, your neighbor may have some issues, or you may yourself, uh, the alarm system uh, RFI kits, uh, home theater RFI kits, these go on all the different in, uh, uh, inputs that you're using. This is an example of one on the AC power line. Uh, computer RFI, if you have a hub or you have a router, uh, routers and hubs tend to be noisy or they can be noisy. But here's, a, here's another interesting little fact. At nighttime, a lot of our computers slow down on the internet. Well, why is that? Well, sometimes it's just because there's a lot of people on the network, but a lot of times it's because everybody's flipping on all the stuff in their houses and it's causing interference. And that interference is either coming in on the coax line, if it's hardwired ethernet, like a spectrum or something like that, or it's coming in off a satellite or it's coming in off of a hardwired uh, telephone line, all right? That interference gets in there. And what happens is it's error correcting a zillion times now, whereas before when the appliances were not, it's not error correcting as much. So it appears that your computer's slower. Well, if you start putting ferrites on your router, okay, guess what? that never gets into your router and therefore it doesn't sit there and error correct all day long or all night long because everybody's turned on everything all right and so that's a, that's a it's a it's a subtle um, a change but by doing that with some of your computer uh, equipment you can generally um, uh, not be degraded as much as, as if you didn't have it all right a lot of people um, we have a garage door one which is real popular too I had a colonel call me from uh, Oklahoma and he said, son, I got a problem here. I put some new, basically to make it uh, short, I put some new uh, radios in some of the jets that were flying around the, the country right now. And when we go over this particular uh, condominium con, uh, 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 condominium group, all 100 garage doors go up at the same time. And uh, I said, well, sir, <laughs> Okay. I think I got a, I think I got a solution for you. So he bought a hundred garage door kits, had his guys install them on all the garage doors and suddenly the problem didn't exist anymore. Because guess what? When you plug it into the top of the ceiling where, where the AC is, it's a great antenna, but it's all those little sense lines are just about the right size for, you know, 120, 130 megahertz stuff. And they just uh, pick it up. The other thing they pick up incidentally is LED lights. A lot of people will put LED lights in their garages and, and suddenly their key fobs in their cars don't work anymore. Or the ones that are on their, uh, that are on their key chains, they won't work anymore because there's so much interference, they can't get through it. All right, so we actually have an LED light filter. It's only ten dollars, but you just put it internally in the in where the light uh, transformer is. You put it around there, and the problem goes away because it backfeeds into the AC power lines, which then become the transmitting antennas. You see, it's, I've had so many of those calls. I finally came up with a little kit for it. And uh, if you put in ten lights, you need ten filters. But that's a, that's a simple thing, and then then your wife can open the garage door again, okay? And you can have dinner. <laughs> All right, so 
some of these some of these things are just they're obvious, but they're, and they're very simple questions to it. So you're essentially using ferrites as uh, as, uh, as little stop signs to stop that stuff either from coming in or going out, and that's the that's the part of it. So I'm going to have a little, few little uh, questions on a quiz here. If you've been paying attention, uh, I'll uh, just go through a couple of questions. Uh, what characteristics of a non-resonant antenna make it superior to a half-wave NFED? Half-wave NFEDs are very popular, and a lot of people use them principally on one or two bands, not on all the bands. Uh, first of all, the non-resonant will work on even and, and odd harmonic frequencies. Well, that's true. The half-wave has, has a complicated matching unit with high voltage. Non-resonant has a simple matching unit and lower voltage. Yes, that's true. The non-resonant can work the work bands, yes. The non-resonant antennas radiate as well as resonant antennas. People have called me to task on that. And I have, I have meter readings on that that show that's exactly the truth. All of the above are true, none of the above are true. I have no idea I was asleep during the talk. So uh, the, the answer is E, it's all of the above for those of you who have been paying attention, all right? Okay, question number two. Where do you place the feed line choke on a non-resonant NFED antenna? All right, right below the matching unit to choke off all the shield radiation. Well, guess what? Then you're choking off half the antenna, right? No, nope, that can't be right. At the radio end of the coax, about 30% of the coax plus the antenna wire length. Well, that sounds like a pretty good answer. In the middle of the coax length to balance the radiation. That's one of those things that you always say, this is a false flag type of thing. Between the antenna tuner and the transceiver? Uh, I don't think so. NFED antennas don't need feed line chokes, all right? Anybody got an idea on that one? It's probably B, right? I, probably. I like B. I like B, there you go. Go to the head of the class, Pat. All right, number three. What's the one, one of the best kept secrets in ham radio, all right? Ladder line has more loss than coax. No, don't think so. An antenna has to be resonant in the hand bands to radiate in the hand bands. No, all ferrites work on all frequencies, so you just buy the cheapest one there is. No, coax noise filters reduce common mode noise level in your receivers so you can hear more stations. Not bad. All extra class hams go to heaven. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the proper answer is D, okay, for those who have been paying attention. Okay, one more, all right. I got you. Which company is your best source for NFED antennas and RFI solutions? Quick answer, you should all get this one. All right, there you go. That's our contact information. How do you get a hold of me? The presentation's available on the website. You can download it, play with it, give it to your friends or whatever. And that's uh, that's all I got to say, but I'll be, I'll be here as long as you want to answer questions. And I'm going to stop sharing. So I'm back back to you. Well, I have a question Thank right you. off. When, when we talk about the choke location on NFED antennas, yeah, uh, I know that it's it's going to be you know close to the you know the, the transmitter, you know, 30% of the, yep. the length. Does it matter whether it's indoors or outdoors? at that point? I mean, are you trying to keep it outdoors? Yeah, you're trying to keep the radiation outside the house. You put it inside the house, then uh, uh, it's going to radiate into something that you may have around the, around the station. So generally, most people put it outside, and if they have to, they just you know they get an extra coax and just wrap it up and then run it into inside. But they do they keep it outside. And ferrites are by the way they're they're weather resistant. You, you just keep one of those rings and you can sit there, you can hang out in the weather forever. It's not going to hurt it. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead, Claude. Don't want to hear Claude. There you go. Now, go ahead and repeat it again. Looks like a problem with the microphone. Claude, you, you, I'm sorry. There I'm we sorry. go. Okay. Uh, the radiation pattern for an NFED, is it similar to a, uh, a, di a standard dipole off, off the sides? Yep, it depends upon the frequency, obviously, but the, the answer is yes. It's basically you're just feeding in a different point. Uh, other than that, that's virtually identical. Now, if you're using an inverted L where part of it's vertical and part of it's horizontal, it'll it'll have a, 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 a 
pretty good takeoff on the higher bands. It won't be much difference on, on the low bands because it's going to be virtually straight up because of the height of it. Thank you. Sure. You guys are easy. Only two questions tonight. I can, <laughs> I can go home early. Uh, um, you know, the in-fed antennas with respect to uh, the, the elevation above the ground, do they, can they work like a, a uh, like an NVIS antenna or, or, or do we need to at least keep it up a minimum level in order to keep the matching right? No, you can, you can make an NVIS. I mean, that's fine. A lot of people just run them, uh, you know, eight to 10 feet up and then out 60 feet, for example, or like I say, they run them around the perimeter of the house uh, or, or in the attic up and down the rafters and they zigzag them uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the attic up there. Uh, other, on, the, on the other hand, I've had folks that put them up 60 feet and they just run them straight out, you know, and then they, they have a big coax length. So it's, it goes, it's all over the place. Uh, the Boy Scouts typically put them up uh, 10, 15 feet and then just run them out to a post or something or a tree. Uh, the, the, the guys that work national parks on the air, uh, they just put them up from their picnic table with a 10 foot pole and take them to a tree. Uh, summits on the air, they just lay them on the rocks. You know? <laughs> they make their four or five contacts and they're done and they go to the next one. That's, <laughs> it's easy to deploy and it's it's a friendly one. You're, you're not going to get shocked with it or something. Mm -hmm. And they, you know what? They work CW too. Okay. <laughs> NFT8. Now, I remember in, in one of your illustrations, you were showing um, one of your antennas as an inverted L installation. Yes. Uh, does that, using it as an inverted L, do you need to have the, the counterpoise or how does the counterpoise uh, affect that, you know, yay or nay, you know, when you use that well, inverted L? Yeah, the, the theory is uh, with an inverted L, you just, you're trying to get a, a higher takeoff angle on the higher frequencies. I mean, a low, excuse me, a lower takeoff angle on the higher frequencies. And the low frequencies, it doesn't do, doesn't do you any good because it's just all going to go straight up anyway. So um, uh, you can use a counterpoise. Typically, you just use the coax as a counterpoise. That's it. That's really all you need. But it may be because of soil or you're next to a mental structure or something like that and and you're trying to work in particular banding you just can't no matter how you mess with it it just won't uh do 40 meters or 20 meters or it's outside the band a little bit so what you do is you add an additional counterpoise to it it's kind of like having parallel dipoles right so you have a you have parallel uh counterpoises and they can be different lengths and they'll take care of the issue for that particular band only Right. They won't have any effect on the other bands. And so uh, the ones that we supply are 215 footers, which generally works uh, on concrete. That's why we use it. We're always on asphalt or something like that. So we just put out 215 footers. And sometimes we run the coax through the, the cafeteria and everywhere else just to get to a, you know, the, the booth and stuff. So you try and put out something close to where the antenna is just to act as a counterpoise. And uh, in some cases, we've had to make them 20 feet long. So we, we splice a five extra feet on there. So it'll work a particular band that's, that's hot that day. You know. And you also at one point uh, said that, you know, with those, those uh, Boy Scout antennas, they were just running, running that inverted L out to a chain link fence somewhere yep. with, with a piece of paracord. Do you need yep. to have, keep, you know, a certain distance away or, or a certain percentage of ours, wavelength from the- oh, when, we, when we do it, we're about three, three feet away, that's it. Okay. Not very long. I mean, it, all, the, all the antennas come with an insulator, a plastic insulator on them. So just run it to, you know, as far as you can. If it's higher, the better, and if farther away, it's probably the better. But it didn't seem to make any difference when we when we were on the air. We were working all those JAs and stuff on forty meters in the Philippines that one morning, and it was only uh, fifteen feet tall, and I think five or six feet tall at the ch at the chain link fence. Wow. Yep. Cool. Yep. So you'll be su you'll be oh, surprised perfect. what you can work with a short antenna. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, I, I certainly you. can. Okay. Uh, could you repeat your test for uh, having common, mo common mode noise on the car? Oh, sure. Sure, I'll be glad to do that. 
Uh, I don't think I have a slide in this one, but I'll tell you how, how it works. So you just pick a band, right, doesn't make any difference which band you have. And the common mode noise generally can be different on each band, by the way, all right? Common mode noise is, is noise that's picked up by all the wires going into your radio at the same time. But typically the longest one is the outside of the coax braid, because it might be you know, 25, 50, 100 feet long, acts as a great antenna. So unhook the, uh, coax from your antenna switch if you're using one and plug it directly in the back of the radio, but only plug in the center pin, just the center pin. Don't screw in the outside yet. Just plug in the center pin and then measure the noise level on your S meter, all right? It's relative. It could be anything you want, S3, S5, S9, doesn't make any difference, all right? And that's your base noise level. And that's coming from the antenna itself. Now, your second receiver is the outside of the coax. So now screw in the outside of the coax connector and see if it jumps up. See if your noise level goes from S3 to S5, for example, or S8 or whatever. All right, some cases it won't change at all. If it does not change at all, that means you're not, you don't have common mode noise coming in on the coax. If it does change and it goes up, that means that a ferrite filter will get rid of that change. And normally you always, you know, you always screw it in when you're using it, right? So if you can get rid of, you know, a couple S units or three or four S units of, of noise uh, by using a simple little filter, that means you can hear people that you probably couldn't hear of before. If you're an FT8 fanatic like I am, you know, you can copy to what, minus 20 dB, 24 dB below the noise. Now I can copy, you know, minus 30 or minus 35 below the noise because I got rid of my noise level. My ambient noise level has gone down essentially because you put a, you got rid of some of the noise coming into it. And if you do that in an, in an antenna switch with all the lines coming in, uh, it will make a huge difference. Or it can make a huge difference if you have, if you have that kind of noise. Great, thanks. Your call sign's almost like I, my old one. Mine was QFA, you're QEX. <laughs> so pretty, pretty close. T total coincidence, but I love it. Yeah. <laughs> well, good. Uh, Thanks ARL for the question. publication notwithstanding. <laughs> any other questions of any other general nature? I've been a hand since 63, so try me. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Bob, thank you very much. It, it sounds like we've got all the questions answered, and and uh, you certainly you certainly out um, outlast all of us with respect to longevity on on uh, as as an amateur. I just turned forty years uh, last month you know, during our meeting that I've uh, been licensed. So uh, sixty three certainly beats my eighty two. <laughs> Congratulations. Six, sixty three was a great year. I was born. <laughs> <laughs> you were born. Yeah, you, you weren't licensed, Dimitri. I was born in 63. <laughs> wow. Uh, okay. Well, once again, Bob, thank you very much on behalf of the Santa Clarita Amateur Radio Club. We do appreciate really appreciate you coming out. Yeah, yep. Palomar's going to get some money from the club. <laughs> I, you guys I saw do some it. things I liked what we were looking at here. Well, there's there's over 350 products, so yeah. you know, take your yep. pick. There's, there's lots of different ones, and we come out with new ones all the time. So Really appreciate it. Oh, all right, God. guys. See you, 73s, to everybody. You bet. Thank you, you later, Bob. Good right. night, and thank you very much again. You're welcome. Bye-bye.